the H2O podcast. This is a free download from BBC Radio Solent. The podcast terms and conditions are on the BBC Radio Solent website, along with details of our other podcasts. The H2O Show on BBC Radio Solent. I'm Robin Knox Johnston, and this week the programme is being recorded in Portsmouth. We'll look ahead to the America's Cup World Series and reflect on the decision to drop sailing from the 2020 Paralympics. But first this week, let's talk about one of the big shocks of the winter. Disappointing news for the sport of disabled sailing worldwide. That's how the Royal Yachting Association has responded to the decision that sailing will not feature at the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games. The International Paralympic Committee has today confirmed its final lineup for sports to feature in Japan. Sailing missing out is a blow to the GB team based at Portland. Let's speak to Jeff Holt, who's the yachtsman who was involved in first bringing sailing to the Paralympics in 1996. Good evening, Jeff. Yeah, hi, good evening to you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Firstly, can we get your reaction to that news today? Uh, I, I thought it was a joke to start with, to be honest. Um, I'm absolutely dumbfounded. I think it's... Uh, it's That's really how we broke the news the at the end of January that sailing must be dropped from the Paralympics in 2020. Well, Jeff Holt, who was one of those responsible for getting the sport into the Paralympic Games, was understandably upset. Well, Jeff has joined us at the ra Round Tower. Jeff, how did you feel when you heard the news? Well, it's two months now, and um, I'm still feeling pretty stunned. Um, I think the world of sailing was stunned when we heard at the end of January this year that sailing was to be dropped from the Tokyo Games in 2020 in the Paralympic um, sport. So, uh, yeah, very surprised, very upset, and uh, I think the world of sailing is hoping to try and get some answers. And you want answers from whom? Well, um, obviously ISAF uh, are the International Sailing Federation. Um, the, for those that are unaware, the International Federation of Disabled Sailing, sorry about the acronyms here, um, had responsibility for developing disability sailing over the last couple of decades and also for making our representations to the International Paralympic Committee. And the, the IPC, the International Paralympic Committee, are telling us um, that sailing did not meet the 32 country criteria. So um, this is where we need to find out either we do or we don't meet those criteria. And if not, why not? So has the um, mantle really moved from the, the disabled sailing side of sailing to ISAF to pick up and try and sort the mess out? Well, ISAF have picked up this, uh, this baton at the end of, uh, at the end of Mar January. They wrote to, I believe, 139 international federations around the world to ask them what they are uh, doing for disabled sailing. Um, they gave them a deadline, which was the end of March, so two days ago. So it'll be interesting to know how many of those countries responded and exactly what, what the, uh, the feedback has been. Well, I'm delighted to say that ISAF Vice President Chris Atkins has joined us here in Portsmouth. Chris, it's very brave of you to join us. But perhaps, actually, you can shed some light on this. Where do we stand? I mean, we're all hoping that we can resubmit and try and get disabled sailing back in the 2020 Olympics. Is there a chance of that? Yeah, well, thanks, Robin. Thanks, Jeff, for the opportunity to update you on this. Uh, and first, I would say that we were at ISAF also shocked uh, and disappointed when we heard at the same time as Jeff did uh, of the announcement. Uh, what ISAF did then was immediately that week, both the CEO and the president of ISAF uh, rang the IPC. We then had an executive meeting uh, that was 10 days later when we discussed it and decided that uh, the president himself, Carlo Croce, uh, would lead discussions with the IPC uh, from that moment onwards. Uh, and, and I can now update you on the progress we've made since then. Uh, so uh, the report from the IPC identified three areas where Paralympic sailing fell short in their evaluation and they were in the areas of finance, in the areas of governance, and as Jeff mentioned, in terms of the number of nations that were actually taking part in Paralympic sailing competitions. So with the merger of IFDS, that was, uh, as Jeff mentioned, the uh, Disabled Sailing Organization into ISAF, IPC is now comfortable that both from a financial point of view and a governance point of view, 
they are actually dealing with the body that they wish to deal with and they have sent us very strong messages that they welcome that liaison. Uh, one other point on it, uh, as a result of the integration, we are anyway working with uh, IPC on a daily basis with preparation for Rio. So IPC is already now dealing on a, at a level with ISAF that it wasn't before. Uh, the tricky issue is the number of nations. And uh, IPC in their feedback, they, they said that they weren't actually particularly comfortable with the accuracy of the data that they have been supplied. And that is why the executive decided to do this survey. Uh, so we went out to all ISAF MNAs. Uh, IFDS had round about 43 nations that were members of it. We in ISAF have 139 nations. So immediately we increased threefold the number of nations that come under the body that's now responsible for uh, disabled sailing. But we wanted to make sure that we knew exactly what the numbers were. Uh, we gave uh, the deadline of 31st of March because it happens that Carlo Croce is having his first meeting with IPC to discuss the outcome. And we can come on to that uh, in a little while. Uh, but the, the feedback we got was that 39 nations have Paralympic sailing programs. Okay. 37 of them actually have programs in the 2.4 meter keelboat class. So that's higher than the IPC threshold. Uh, if you look at the number of nations that have taken part in disabled sailing competitions in the Paralympic classes over the last three years, that happens to be 31. <laughs> so uh, we are close to the threshold, but what the survey shows is that actually we do exceed it. The other thing that came out of the survey was that 11 new nations want ISAF support in setting up these programs. So we have already initiated within the development department of ISAF a Paralympic sailing development program that uh, we've initiated it. Okay, it's, it's still being worked on, it isn't out there yet. But the purpose of that is to bring these extra 11 nations in uh, so that instead of just beating the number, <laughs> we're, we're well and truly uh, better than the number. If I could add one other, because it's so closely linked. Uh, we all really value sailing as an activity that inspires disabled people. IPC, in counting the numbers, they just count the number of nations that take part in the Paralympic sailing classes. Now, as sailors, we know that you, know, you sail this class, then you sail the other, then you sail another class, but you are at heart a sailor. One of the things we want to discuss with IPC today is that, is that sailing is beyond just the three classes that are sailed in the Paralympics. Uh, and it'll be really interesting for the executive uh, and the wider community to get the feedback from IPC on that particular point. Jeff, uh, th that's great to hear. Thank you, Chris. I mean, we've, I've learned a new thing, few new things there. Um, not necessarily for this conversation, but you raised an interesting point at the end about IPC counting the Paralympic sailing classes. There is a, it does raise the question in that is, oh, are they the right classes? And sailing those three classes, um, are the costs of doing that excluding the poorer nations from participating? But um, that's probably not for now. Uh, but they're, they're very good questions. Um, one of the things that we hope to achieve with a tighter relationship with IPC is that we also understand what their goals are, what their wishes are, and make sure then that any decisions we do make over what equipment we're racing in matches the, the wishes of IPC. And uh, at the moment, the 2.4 meter plainly pulls the nations in. It is a very popular uh, disabled class. Uh, the sonar uh, historically has been a strong class. We now have the new and exciting SCUD class that is designed to give the thrill of asymmetric sailing. Through that mix, we are able to uh, bring to the Paralympic Games sailors of all disability. 
because within the sonar class with the three people you can have a very disabled person, a medium disabled, a less disabled. But we want to look at whether the three classes together are the best ones for, for maximizing participation. And Jeff's comment on cost uh, is a really key comment as well. So I think what I'm hearing is, uh, and I think what many of us have thought all along, is either, and we're not necessarily, I'm not like using the blame word, but we've actually got to try and find out what went wrong so we can fix it. Either IFDS failed to represent in truly um, the numbers of participants over the last two years. IPC gave IFDS three opportunities over two years to give these figures. Um, and if you, you've said at the beginning of the interview, ISAF were only aware of this um, at the beginning of uh, in January when we heard. So IFDS have either failed to d give, um, to explain the participation numbers correctly, or sailing does not meet that 32 country criteria. Now, until we actually identify which one of those it is, we can't really fix the problem. And now it's in ISAF's hands um, to do so. And, and I use the term poison chalice. I know that's used regularly, and I've heard that used, that you've inherited this from IFDS. I believe IFDS has only been absorbed into ISAF in the last three to four months. So ISAF has, has, has been left holding the baby, so to speak. Um, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I'd, um, I'd quarrel with a few comments that you make, but I understand what you're saying. Uh, what ISAF absolutely is doing from now is forging a close working relationship with IPC so that we can understand what their priorities are. I think we shouldn't focus exclusively on the number 32. That's just one of their criteria, but of course, what they are judging is they are judging the sport of sailing against their other possible sports. So what we have to do with IPC is show how important a sailing is to the Paralympic Games and at the same time how important sailing is to the wider disabled community. And that's the relationship that we're starting to build with the meeting today. Just very quickly, can I read you something I received about four weeks ago? And it's an email from a 16-year-old, um, and it says, I've been disabled all my life with cerebral palsy. I discovered sailing a couple of years ago, and it has changed my life. My dream is to represent my country at the Paralympics. This decision has broken my dreams, and I feel I have nothing to aim for in my life. How would ISAF respond to that? Uh, ISAF would uh, take it to the IPC. And one of the, as well as the specific numbers from the MNAs, ISAF has received a lot of similar emails. Uh, and they are, they are being taken to the IPC today because they are part of the significance of the IPC decision to the wider disabled sailing community and the disabled community worldwide. I think um, all of us who've been supporting disabled sailing for something over 20 years in my case, were absolutely shocked, Chris, when this decision came out. Do you think we've got a chance of reinstating sailing in the 2020 Olympics? Uh, today's meeting is the first step. The letter from the IPC that announced its decision uh, asked, asked us to, to rejuvenate, regroup and resubmit for a place uh, in 2024. Uh, on receipt of that, we immediately told IPC that our goals was to be represented within 2020. Now, obviously, that is an IPC decision, uh, but the meeting in Bond is the first step towards seeing if we can be reinstated for 2020. So, so the door is still ajar? Uh, any door is always ajar, Robin. <laughs> Chris, thank you very much for bringing us up to date. And I think uh, I'll be joined by every sailor I've ever met. We're getting right behind you to get on to the International Paralympics and say, come on, reinstate us. This is a growing sport. It's one that's bringing a, a new lease of life for an awful lot of disabled people. And we just want to see it encouraged to continue to grow. Thanks so much for your time. Jeff, you've been really, you were very upset when this decision came out. You've been working hard to try and get it uh, reversed. You feel a bit more encouraged? Yeah, I feel inc more encouraged seeing Chris here and the fact that ISAF have, you know, volunteered to put someone forward to, to speak. Um, I think, you know, there was a deafening silence for a long time and people were wondering what on earth was going on. Sailing's more than a sport, isn't it? It's a way of life. Um, it, there are no discriminations in sailing. When you and I sail together, we don't think about, you know, my disability or your age.
<laughs> I, I think in that respect, I'm slightly better off than you. <laughs> I'm catching you up all the time. H2O on BBC Radio Solent. Well, since that interview was conducted, the IPC has confirmed that the process to select sports for the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games has officially ended, meaning their decision on the 3rd of February 2015 stands. ISAF and the IPC did welcome the merger between ISAF and IFDS, though, and they added they will continue to work hard to reinstate sailing in the 2024 Paralympic Games and also pursue the slimmest possibility of sailing being included at Tokyo 2020. The H2O podcast from BBC Radio Solent. It's going to uh, help to reduce the costs of competing in the America's Cup, producing these amazing boats that we're racing around in, um, but also it will help with the costs of actually running the events, uh, creating a global circuit. Logistically, these, this new class of boat will be able to fit into a 40-foot container, so you can imagine the, the, the effects, therefore, of, of the, the shipping costs, the logistical costs of creating a sustainable long-term event become much more realistic. Download it now for free from our website, bbc.co.uk slash Solent. It's all in navy blue. There's lots of badges that says Royal Navy, and you can see what the, what, uh, the job the guy does because he's got the badge there. The H2O podcast from BBC Radio Solent, bbc.co.uk slash Solent. So where are we now, Robin? It's cold. Sherry, we've come down to the Round Tower, which was built by Henry V to keep the French out of Portsmouth. And this is part of Spice Island, which is old Portsmouth, if you like. Uh -huh. And, of course, it's a wonderful site because we can, from here we can look right up the harbour towards Fareham, um, towards the hills. We've got Gosport over there. And, of course, coming out to the sea, we're looking across the Isle of Wight. There's Ride. But we're actually looking over the area where the America's Cup is going to take place. Oh. And that's why we've come here. Now, this is the America's Cup World Series happening in July? This is the America's Cup World Series, 23rd to 26th of July. Fantastic. Which is going to take place right here in Portsmouth, off the beach. And, and could I actually come and stand here on the Round Tower and watch it? You'll have to get here early, I suspect. I, I think this will be a very popular viewing point. But, but Rob Andrews is from the sailing side, and Leslie Greenhow is the event side. So, Rob, what are we going to see if we were standing here on the 23rd of July? On the 23rd of July, uh, that would be the Thursday, so that's the first day. The racing, we have practice racing on the Friday, and then the races that count for the America's Cup World Series are on Saturday and Sunday. So standing here, the boats are moored uh, down at the Royal Naval Base. They come out from Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, they'll sail through here and go on to our race course, which is down opposite the uh, South Sea Common. I mean, it's going to be so accessible for people, isn't it? I mean, it, it's, it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for, to really show people what this latest exciting sailing is all about. Leslie, um, how is it going to be for people to get here to see it? What we've done is we've created a number of hubs and areas, so we really want this to be the, the event happening in Portsmouth that weekend. So whether you go to Historic Dockyard to watch the boats get craned in and out in the mornings, you then watch them all along the waterfront um, on the parade of sail. And Rob didn't mention on Thursday we're going to have an actual parade of sail. So people who come on Thursday will see the boats being paraded. You go to the race village. South sea Common is going to be a huge race village, free to view area called the Waterfront Festival, capacity 30,000 people each day, and then a ticketed area called the Fan Zone, capacity 5,000 a day. So lots, basically lots for everyone, whether you want to go in your own space or go to the race village or go to Historic Dockyard or watch from your cafe latte in Gunwharf Keys. <laughs> it's something everywhere to see. I think now would be a good moment to ask, if people do want to come down and see what is going to be a very exciting event, how do they get tickets? OK, so the free tickets, the Festival Arena, you still have to register for your tickets because we need to manage numbers. You go on ticketmaster.co.uk slash AC World Series Portsmouth um, and you register for your free tickets. Um, we have at the moment sold out of tickets on the Saturday and Sunday, which is a fantastic response, but plenty of tickets still available on the fri Thursday, Friday. Friday, remember, you'll see two races just like the other days. Um, and then um, if you want fan zone, same thing, Ticketmaster and acworldseriesportsmouth.com is the event site. Being a boat owner, how close can I get to watch it on the water? 
we're working really closely with the Queen's Harbour Master in Portsmouth. And so the, there's a local notice to mariners, which he's published a provisional one. You can link into that from our website or you can go on to the Queen's Harbour Master website to look at that. And uh, the plan is that the, there's public viewing areas probably about 200 metres away from uh, the sailing. We still recommend though that uh, despite the fact it is sailing on the water, uh, when you are on the water you'll have to look out for other boats so it's how much racing do you actually see whereas on the land there's screens, there's commentary, there's concessions, everything like that so we're, we're trying to get people, even boat owners, to leave their boat at home that weekend and watch it from the shore because we actually think it will be better. Yeah obviously it's always easier when someone's explaining to you what's going on isn't it Robin? Well, I always find it so, yes. Uh, it depends who I ask, though, doesn't it? Rob, I think uh, what people want to know is exactly where is the racing going to take place because these are very fast boats. We're talking about speeds up to 45 miles an hour. I mean, and they're going to be shifting, so they're going to need space, aren't they, to manoeuvre. So where exactly, I mean, looking out on the water here, where, what area are you sort of marking out for the racing? I think it's easiest if you imagine a nautical mile box by 800 metres wide. If you align that to the wind, where the leeward end of that box is on the grandstand, uh, the, sorry, the bandstand area on South Sea Common by the castle. If you imagine that as the alignment, then that's the area that we're stopping everybody going into so that we, as you say, create this safe area for these boat, these amazing boats to whiz around in at 40 knots. But they are going to be based basically on the, on the bandstand and, and you will adjust the course to suit the wind on that particular day. Yeah, absolutely. There'll be information linked in uh, on a daily basis, as I say, on the local notice to mariners. We'll have up to 40 marshals out there. We'll lay marks around this box so we'll do everything to make it easy for, with uh, guidance for people to keep out of the box and have a great view of these amazing boats. Now, the America's Cup is actually going to happen in Bermuda in 2017, the next big race. Just explain to us what the World Series is. OK, the World Series is effectively the start of the road to the America's Cup in 2017. Uh, all of the teams compete in 2016 and 2017, and this gets them certain points that carry forward, and more importantly, it gets them a seeding. So as they enter into the final stages of the America's Cup, we've been through these prelim preliminary rounds of uh, the America's Cup through the World Series. And it's not just Portsmouth. You've got a whole calendar of events this year. Where, where, do, where do you start? Where are you going? OK, it starts in Italy in uh, June uh, the 5th and 6th. Comes to Portsmouth in mid-July. We then go on to Gothenburg in Sweden in August. And the 2016 season ends up in Bermuda in October. That's a nice uh, calendar. <laughs> I think it's going to be very, very exciting. So basically the Thursday is when they start getting the boat sorted, parade of sail. Friday they're doing the practices. Saturday, Sunday, they're actually out there racing. Leslie, you want to, um, well, both of you have said you want to get me off my boat, off the water and onto the common. What, what can I actually do and see on the common? Um, so in the waterfront festival area, I describe that as a family-friendly day out full of entertainment education activity so if you can imagine a whole day from watching bands on screen watching commentary um, education about the technology why do these boats fly above water so they're foiling catamarans how does that work if the first time you see it it kind of defies all logic and um, see the boats on display just come and food and drink and lots to do um, in the fan zone is really for people who want to come and watch the racing immerse themselves in how does the course work who's ahead of who who are the skippers the sailors so the two areas are their absolute action-packed program in both places well wow, it sounds like you've got it highly organized fantastic uh, I'll be on the common well Rob and, and Leslie I must say thank you so much you made this very clear to me anyway and I hope to other people as well but it is going to be very exciting in July I just hope I'm back across the Atlantic in time to see it. And one of the things I'd like to say is that, you know, obviously we all want to support the home team. Ultimately, we want to win the Cup and bring it back to Portsmouth full time. So, um, you know, we all want to be there, support Ben Ainsley Racing. And, you know, we can see the majestic base behind us. Um, and, you know, Ben Ainsley Racing and the 1851 Trust are all going to be there. And, you know, that's, that's really, we want to be flying our flag. Well, I mean, we're all hoping that Ben brings the cut back here. Boy, isn't that going to be fantastic for Portsmouth and for Britain? It's going to be super. 
And there's a link to the America's Cup World Series website on our programme page for today. Go to bbc.co.uk slash Solent. H2O on BBC Radio Solent. I'm Robin Knox Johnston. And I'm Shelley Jory Lee. And this week we're recording a show in Portsmouth. We've moved to a building site just a few hundred yards from the Round Tower. It's very noisy here, Robin. Well, that's because it's a building site, Shelley. <laughs> well, Shelley, we've hardly seen you this winter. What have you been up to all winter? I've been, um, I've had quite an interesting winter. I've done lots of travel, which has been great, but I've actually, I raced in the Key West World Championships out in America. Didn't do too well, so we won't go any further on that one because I had a little bit of a whoopsie again. Um, but the boat's all fine and it then went on to compete on the Sunday and did really well. Um, but unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to race because I got a little bump on the head again. This, that was the whoopsie, was it? Yeah, I had a little bit of a whoopsie, but it was great to be out there back racing with Lucas Oil, you know, back in the fast time, in the harness, back about 120 mile an hour. It was, it was great and I really needed it, but it just wasn't the most successful weekend. OK, but you hadn't raced for a while, so this was the first race for a while, wasn't it? Yes, it was, it was getting back onto it last year. Um, this year I'm trying um, again to... Um, I want to get my endurance team. I think after doing Cows Talk E Cows with you, Robin, endurance is the way forward for me and I'm, I'm working hard to get an endurance team back on the water, which is, uh, as usual, as you well know, the sponsorship is actually harder to get than actually to finish the race sometimes. I would agree with that. But well, when you say endurance, I mean, what sort of length of race are you talking about? Well, it will be similar to what we, we all did with Neil, our producer. Um, it will be cows, talky, cows back. So you're talking sort of four or five hours. We'll do the Skagorak Cross. Um, they're doing a race from Venice to Monte Carlo this year. Uh, you know, that sort of, so long, long endurance. Not necessarily top, top speeds. But um, getting across the water, uh, you know, as, as fast as you can, but realising that the boat, the equipment and the people on board have got to survive to the end, as it were, which often is, you know, is the toughest bit. So, yeah, but it's, it's, been, a, it's been a great winter. It's been a challenging one. And um, I haven't finished yet, actually. Good. Well, it's nice to have you back, Shelley. Thank you, Robin. Now, I have to mention the route de rum. I'm sure you're bored now of chatting about it to everybody, but it... It was incredible, Robin. I don't think any of us believed. Well, I personally was worried to death, and I know your daughter, Sarah, was. We were both thinking, what the devil is he doing? Why is he doing this at his age? What's he got to prove? But you proved us all wrong. Well, I had nothing to prove. I was doing it because I just bloody well wanted to, really. I, <laughs> I, I was looking... I felt like racing. I, when I did the Sydney Hobart a couple of years back, I thought, hmm, I've been missing this. And I looked around, I thought, well, I've got the boat. What races are coming up? And I saw the route to run was coming. I did it in 82, and I thought, yeah, that was a great race. It's well organized, it's a fun race to do. Leave the cold of Europe to go to the Caribbean. I thought, yeah. So I contacted them and said, would you let me enter? And they said, of course, you know, do the qualifiers, same as everyone else. And um, you're up for it. So I thought, right, let's go and enter. But why do you have to do it single-handed? I know that race is single-handed. We just feel a little happier if maybe somebody went with you. Is, is, it, is it in your nature that you just love to be alone at sea? No, I enjoy sailing with a crew just as much as um, I, I enjoy being on my own. I think being on your own is a different sort of sailing. I mean, everything's down to you. You have no rows with the crew, no arguments with the cook. You just get on, you run your life around your own schedule. When I bring the boat back later this summer in a race back from Newport to Cowes, I've got those five of us on board. So it's a different sort of race, but they're all close friends, so it'll be fun. So the, the, the boat that you actually raced in the Route de Rum single-handedly, you're now going to race with a crew across the Atlantic. How does that work? Because surely the boat's set up just for you as a single-handed sailor? I, d I d can't understand how that's going to work. Well, actually, it's not difficult at all. I mean, it just means there's more people to help me with the heavy work. It means you can always, you know, have someone on watch, on lookout, um, more people to share the decisions with, talk it through, make sure we're getting the weather right. The people I'm going with, I mean, the three of us are solo circumnavigators. Another one was Commodore of Rourke. The other one organises racing in Monte Carlo. I've got a team of really good sailors, and they're all personal friends. Right. So I think this is going to be great fun. OK, I'd like to know who's going to be boss. Well, it's my boat. Fair enough. <laughs> no arguments there, then. Um, now, obviously, another great achievement of the winter, which um, I think was 
I think you're the only person to ever have got the Yachtsman of the Year award four times. Actually, Ben Ainsley and I share that. And I'm a little bit concerned that he might drag ahead of me a bit if he wins the America's Cup. So I'm wondering what I can do to catch him up again in the future. Well, he, to be fair, he has got some younger years on you. He's got quite a few years left and you haven't got that many. I don't think that's a huge disadvantage for him, to be honest with you. Um, I'm sure we can get over that. After all, in my mind, I'm only 49. Right, so we've got to make sure that Ben Ainsley doesn't get Yachtsman of the Year award for a fifth time. Fifth is getting a bit greedy, to be uh, fair. You know something? I'd love him to get Yachtsman of the Year for the fifth time because it means we'd won the America's Cup. And I think, wow, wouldn't that be fantastic? I think Ben Ainsley should get it just for the work he's doing here at this building site and the legacy he's building and the foundations. And, you know, I mean, regardless if they actually win, what he's done in Portsmouth is amazing. And it's only just beginning too. I, I think this is going to be major for Portsmouth, major for Hampshire actually, and for the south coast, the whole Solent area, because the cutting edge of what they're doing with these boats is no one's ever done this before. We're really reaching out. It's like going to the moon almost. And what they're doing is phenomenal. And it's all that technology, it's going to be here. It's going to you know, be spread out in the area. People are going to come here because we have got the technology. If you were... Uh... Now, I'm being serious for once. If you were young enough and fitter, maybe, or fit enough, would you race in the America's Cup? Would you love that on the foils and the speed? Oh, gosh, wouldn't you? I mean, just be, I'm just watching those boats, you think, hey, I just want to get out on one of them. Oh. And I don't think it's anything to do with age. I still want to get out on one of them. Well, well so do I. I mean, for me, it's the, it's, the speed, it's the speed and the adrenaline. That is the closest, the sailing world. And the extreme 40s, I think, as well. I did, I did enjoy that with Shirley Robertson. But the extreme 40s, this, to me, is sailing coming up to the speed and, and adrenaline that we get in the powerboat racing world by far. So I would love it. But I, I just wondered if it was your cup of tea or not, but it quite clearly is. Oh, it is. And the other point, of course, Sherry, is it doesn't use an egg cup of petrol. But here we are. We're actually at the site where the building's going up for the headquarters for Ben Ainsley Racing. And you have to say, looking at it, it's a huge building, isn't it? I mean, it's a very impressive building. Modern, but very, very functional, I would have thought. There's lorries coming in with bits and pieces for it. There's men, looks like welding and riveting. It's just everything's happening here at the moment. And the chap in charge looking after it from... The BAR point of view is Jonathan Goring. Jonathan, this is a pretty responsible task. Um, well, it's responsible. It's also great fun, actually, Robin. It's one of the fastest programmes I've ever been involved in. Um, we got our planning uh, consent in June last year. Um, uh, we started on site proper in, uh, in, in, in September and, uh, and, and we're looking at a building here that's nearly finished. Uh, we finish uh, hand over the ground floor on the first floor on the uh, 14th of May. So very exciting. Well, it's all happening here, but I mean, it, it's an amazing construction job, really, isn't it? I mean, the design itself, I think, is fantastic. And it's standing here on this site, which would otherwise, I suppose, gone for housing or something. Instead of which, we're going to have a very, very active site with a lot going on that's going to encourage sailing everywhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the great thing about it, when we, when we conceived the site uh, or, the, or the building, we decided we didn't just want a shed, that, you know, a boat shed. Um, we decided we wanted our design team to be in one place. Uh, we wanted to open it to visitors. Uh, but also, as is very important these days with America's Cup, we allow uh, the media to come in. So we actually have a, a top floor, which is for sponsors and media. Um, and so the building really does everything, including... Um, uh, particularly the visitor centre for local people to come in and local schools to tour and so on and so forth and become part of the whole BAR thing, really. Well, I mean, looking at it from the street, I mean, you've got two huge hangars there and then you've got all these various floors and everything else going on. Are you actually going to be building the America's Cup boats on this site? Um, we, are, we will be assembling the America's Cup boats, yes. I mean, uh, effectively, um, the America's Cup boats are... They're, they're a whole new world, actually, for sailing. Um, they foil, which means they go up and they fly above the water, uh, which means that we're constantly developing the, uh, the foils, the wings, and so on and so forth. And for that reason, we have to keep interchanging components. So the whole idea is that the, 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 the uh, ground floor, which is huge, the, the door the floor alone is 12 metres by 30. The ground floor can take different kinds of boats, different configurations of wing, uh, new, new foils and so on and so forth. Um, so the whole idea is we can do everything here, including design the boat. Right. And, and of course the team's going to be based here, the actual athletes, and that's what they are, who are also going to be here. And you put in a gym for them to keep them fit. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I made the big mistake, Robin, of embarking on their training program last June. Uh, and, and I've got to say, it's been a fairly heady affair for me uh, at the age of 50. But uh, yeah, I mean, these are, these are um, proper athletes. So uh, we have guys who um, would actually be in the top 20 in the world uh, as rowers uh, in our sailing team. They are so fit. So um, uh, uh, incredible team. Uh, we have conditioning coaches, we have nutritionists, we have physios. Uh, and excuse the noise behind me, that's just uh, our friends, you know, going at it on the building. Um, yeah, so, so we have the whole lot, the, uh, and, and the, the team are very, very fit athletes already um, since, you know, since we assembled them last year. What, what um, have the locals sort of thought about all of this? I mean, nobody likes buildings put up in their backyard, as they say. H how's it gone down with the locals? Well, we, I actually have a lot of sympathy for anyone uh, who just sees something on a drawing and, and, and has to guess, more or less, uh, what they're going to get on, in, in, you know, on their backyard. Uh, the reality is, I think they're, they're comforted, actually, now looking at the building. It's possibly not as large as they felt it was going to be um, on the drawings, because you can never quite tell. Um, I would say 95%, and we do know this because they come to, uh, we have a meeting every, every fortnight with locals, 95% are absolutely pro. Uh, we've had a lot of debate about parking and all those kind of things that, that, uh, that you really have to get, get, get under the, the, the skin of uh, over the last uh, six months, and I think we've ironed out a lot of concerns, to be frank. But, so we, we, we have a very supportive group of local people. What was actually here before, Jonathan? Um, originally there was a coal yard, um, latterly um, a boat yard, but it was all a bit higgledy-piggledy, so uh, lots of small boats and car park. So, so effectively what we've done is, we've cons or the council have done, is, is consolidate all the boats in, into racks on one side, and we've taken the other side of the canvas side. So it's actually going to look you know, a lot better and neater and be, and be more scenic for the people locally? It's certainly a lot tidier, yes. I mean, and the building will look pretty, uh, pretty slick, I have to say. Uh, and uh, um, it is, it, it, uh, as you will see uh, um, as we open it, it is a truly British representation of, of America's Cup as well. Um, there may be a few uh, um, uh, fairly, uh, fairly clear um, indications as to uh, what country we're sailing for. And what's actually happening in July? Uh, in July, we have the World Series coming, so um, that is our chance as Ben Ainsley Racing to prove on, on, on our home turf uh, that we have a team to be reckoned with. Um, it's the first um, uh, you know, real chance we get. Um, there is a, race in, there's a, a World Series race in it Italy before, but actually it's the first chance we get uh, to test our metal. And dare I say, is the building going to be ready? Uh, the building is actually, we're actually moving into the building um, on the 14th of May. Uh, that's the design team and, and also the boats. Um, but but uh, the, the World Series isn't in, until July, so we've allowed ourselves a little bit of headspace, which is wise. <laughs> I mean, what I don't think people realise is uh, this is at the cutting edge, isn't it? I mean, it's not just um, hydrodynamics, this is aerodynamics as well, the way these boats are now flying at 45 knots. So you're bringing together some pretty intelligent, bright scientists almost, aren't you, to, to build these boats and, and keep improving them? Absolutely. It, it is right on, the, right on the edge of aerodynamics and hydrodynamics and, 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 you know, and traditional boat building. Um, so so, uh, so uh, we have people in the team from Formula One, uh, we have people from, uh, in the team from the aerospace industry uh, and, 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 and particularly uh, in electronics as well. There's some pretty sophisticated electronics. Uh, the, the whole diagnostic process is, is akin to a Formula One pit lane. So uh, yeah, the, the whole world has moved on. Um, this is the very first time that boats have been designed for the America's Cup to foil right from the outset. So that is to go to fly effectively from the outset. So uh, our team have all been geared towards that. During the World Series in July, what's actually going to be happening in the building? Uh, we'll be running our team from the, uh, from the building. It, it will be open to visitors. Um, the visitor centre will be open and there will be a, ch there will be a chance um, uh, for, uh, for visitors then and, and, and afterwards to come and a sample a bit of America's Cup. So we, we will have simulators in the, uh, uh, in the building which can be used. Uh, we will have grinding machines if anyone fancies a chance at, uh, to, to, to winch uh, as our athletes winch. Um, uh, and, and, and so that will all be set up for people to come, you know, to come in and out of. I mean, what we're seeing here really is a pathfinder, isn't it? Someone who's exploring new boundaries of boat construction and methods of sailing boats as well. So presumably this will then spread down throughout the whole boating industry in Britain. 
Yes, I mean, uh, the, the, as we know, the, the America's Cup is the oldest, uh, it's the oldest uh, sporting trophy. 1851 was the last time we, uh, uh, we, 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 well, when we lost it, actually, and, and, and uh, the last time we really saw it on, the sh on these shores. So um, uh, it, it, it's a great example to create a role model for, uh, for youngsters, engineers, sailors um, to, to get involved in sport. Well, I'm sure we're going to be back again, Jonathan, to have a look as things develop. But uh, in the meantime, I can see an awful lot of activity. We better let you get back to building this building. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. You can come and help me if you wish, uh, and I'll see you soon, <laughs> probably at next week's community meeting. <laughs> and there's a link to the Ben Ainsley Racing website on our programme page for today. Go to bbc.co.uk slash Solent. Well, this is the brand new series of H2O from BBC Radio Solent. I'm Robin Knox Johnston. And I'm Shelley Jory Lee, and this week we're in Portsmouth, and this is the building site for the brand new Ben Ainsley Racing Team. Well, one of Sir Ben's aims has been to leave a lasting legacy in the city, and part of the legacy has been to form the 1851 Trust. Alistair Eckers is the 1851 Trust Chief Executive. Alistair, thank you very much for sparing the time to talk to us. Uh, thank you for speaking to me. Can you explain to us exactly what 1851 is all about? Uh, I must confess, the name doesn't give away much about what we do, but... Um, the 1851 Trust takes its name from the 1851 exhibition, which was a, an amazing showcase of British innovation, technology and design. Um, and the 1851 Trust has been formed really to, um, to uh, really harness the power of the America's Cup and once again showcase uh, uh, those things and um, really encourage a new generation of uh, innovation, um, but it's much more than just a sailing trust. It's, a, it's about how science, technology, engineering and maths, uh, taking them out of the classroom and seeing the practical application. And here we're stood in front of a building that does just exactly that. Well, coincidentally, of course, 1851 was when we lost the 100 guinea cup to the schooner yacht America. And of course, part of what we're seeing down in Portsmouth is the effort to get it back again. But, so you're putting together all the science and technology that is going into these incredible boats but you're trying to spread that out into the community amongst young people and in fact amongst industry as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the uh, visitor centre is incredibly exciting. I'm a, I'm, I have to confess to being a landlubber, but I'm absolutely fascinated by some of the design processes. Um, and um, it was clear that the team wanted uh, a visitor experience that was as dynamic as the team itself, as dynamic as the boat, uh, as exciting as the race. And it's fair to say that we are, I'm not giving too much away, but um, it's fair to say that visitors are in, uh, in for a treat. It's a really immersive experience, lots of participative uh, things to see, do, press, play uh, in the visitor centre, um, as well as viewing platforms to actually see the workshops and some of the, um, some of the activities of the team. So it's very exciting. If we've got young teenagers listening to the programme who, who who have done, I don't know, technology drawing at school, want to get into boat and design. Is there actual jobs available for them here at the new at the new centre? How do they go about that? Um, well, certainly, there's um, the, uh, if people look on the uh, the Bar Team website, there's um, already in place um, uh, an undergraduate scheme. I'd say for school children, there's lots of opportunities there for um, for volunteer engagement uh, to become a wave maker, uh, and we hope when the four days of the World Series. Um, passes on, passes the baton on to the next location that some of those volunteers will want to stay engaged and there's certainly opportunities for uh, volunteers in the new visitor centre. Fantastic, at least it's, it's opening up jobs for the young people Robin. Well uh, yes it is and, and what I'd like to do is follow this up because it'll be very interesting Alistair if we may to come and talk to you again as things develop and yeah. see how this is working, how you're getting young people in and help you encourage more of them to come along. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. I, I I would really like that, and I think the um, the the mantra that um, I think the team have uh, have adopted is to try a different approach, and certainly that's something we want to look at too. And um, so at the moment, for example, um, engaging uh, young people who are perhaps not interested in sailing or the marine industry, and, and really trying to ascertain why that is, and trying to to change some of those perceptions. Um, at the moment, for example, we, um, we have submitted a funding bid to um, uh, equip uh, local sailing schools with GoPro cameras and uh, selfie sticks so that the first time young sailors can actually share their experiences uh, on social media channels with their friends and, and, and share that experience. And hopefully, if it goes viral, it encourages more young people to do the same. Shelley, what's a selfie stick? Oh. 
I do apologise, Alistair. A selfie stick is what you take. You can now take your se um, a selfie on your camera. I'll show you later, Robin. But you can do a stick so you can get a much more panoramic view. Do you know what a GoPro is? No. Oh, dear. GoPro is a little camera you can put anywhere on your crash helmet on the boat and you can show any angle of all your action. It just spreads the word of sport and shows what an exciting life it is and etc. And it's... It's brilliant what Alistair is saying, to put GoPros and selfie sticks into these sailing clubs. Don't worry, we'll bring you up to date in a minute. I'll show you later. <laughs> but um, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. And I just, I think, I agree with you. We need to come back in a few months' time and see how many young people we've got in here and jobs we've created and everything for the, for the young, you know, young technology people who are coming out now. I mean, what a great place to start in a racing team. I mean, Alison, before we come back again, how far do you think this legacy is going to go? Well, uh, let's start geographically. So uh, we have this amazing vis visitor facility here, uh, and we're going to run it in parallel. Our plan, our intention is to have uh, a mobile visitor centre that tours the country, uh, that uh, goes to high footfall areas for young people, so shopping malls, uh, various other locations, to really highlight some of the amazing stuff that's going on in the maritime industry. Uh, parallel to that, we'll also have a virtual visitor centre, which is online, so the reach is even wider. Um, but, but definitely, we're here to stay. The 1851 Trust is, is, um, is certainly harnessing all the activity that's uh, leading up to 2017, but our remit goes far, far beyond. So we want to, uh, I guess, my aspiration for the charity, and obviously we are uh, very new in our infancy and we're, we're still formulating our plans, but... Um, if the RNLI is the national maritime charity uh, that is renowned for saving lives, then it would be great if the 1851 could build a reputation for changing them. Um, so that's quite a big aspiration. I think that's uh, very much looking into the, uh, to the, to the far horizon. So we're here for the longer term, definitely. Well, we Brits have always been a very inventive nation. And it's good to see this being encouraged at this level. Bring young people on, make them realise that the technology that they can learn and then apply and keep this country in the lead. Alistair, thank you so much for sparing your time. We wish you well, and we look forward to chatting to you when things are a bit further developed. Great. Thanks very much, both of you. Thank you. Well, thanks to everyone for making this recording possible. To ISF Vice President Chris Atkins and, of course, Jeff Holt, MBE. To Rob Andrews and Leslie Greenhalgh for the America's Cup World Series, and to Alistair Adkas from the 1851 Trust, Jonathan Goring here at Ben Ainsley Racing. The eyes of the world are going to be on the Solent later this year and we will be here of course but that's actually not only that's happening that's all that's happening this summer we've got um, loads of things happening events this summer we've got P1 coming back to Gosport and Bournemouth and of course I'm going to be there doing all your television for you and presenting again you must come to a P1 race Robin I'd, I'd love to I'd actually rather see you racing in it but anyway you're going to be there that's the important thing We'll also be at the usual events like Cars Week, Round the Island Race, Old Gaffers and the Gosport Maritime Festival. And HMS Victories has its 250th anniversary next month. Oh, and the Royal Yacht Squadron have got the 200th anniversary. That's going to be a good one. And, of course, the America's Cup World Series. And that's why we're here. And this year, of course, Robin, we've got the Clipper Race again. Now, how often does that happen? It's every other year? Every or? other year, yes. We're busy training people up at the moment. So have, have people actually applied already? If they want to, you know, make this life-changing experience and go off and race around the world, are they, would they have already signed up? Would they be in training? We are in the process of training over 600 people at the moment for the next race. And do all those 600 people get to go, or do you then have to select? Unless we find something seriously wrong with them, I would say they'll all be going. And you've got all the skippers and everyone lined up to go? All the skippers have been selected. They're in doing our special skipper training course at the moment. But really now we're focusing on training up the crews. Do we know where the start is yet? Ah, no, that's a little no, bit of a secret. Why so secretive about that? Why is it such a secret? Because we're still dealing with the people uh, to get it organised, so it takes time to do. OK, well, give us some warning so we can be there, of course. Um, and also, um, that's where the start will be and that's where you finish. And it goes for a year, doesn't it? So how long does it actually take them to do from A to A, to a as it were? Well, we start on the 30th of August from the start place and they'll be back the following July. So they're, they're covering something like 47,000 miles in that time.
Amazing. One day, I, one day I will do it, I promise. If I'm not sure I can actually survive on a yacht for that long sailing, but I will try. If you can survive being bashed around for four or five hours on those silly little power boats, Shelley, you can certainly survive a leg of the clipper race. Well, that's it for this week. Next week, we're recording in Portland and we're chatting with the Weymouth and Portland National Sailing Academy, hearing about Bart's Bash 2 and we're going to be climbing another lighthouse. The H2O Podcast. Thank you for downloading this week's H2O Podcast from BBC Radio Solent. For more news on...